Hi, my name's Kieran. I am an advisor on the board of Accelerate Me. I ran the program for four years while I was an undergraduate. In my first year of university, I was on the program with an e-commerce t-shirt business, which fell apart very quickly, but I learned a huge amount, like 18 starting a business, it's fun. Um, and over the last two years, so basically I graduated in Manchester in 2020 um, during COVID, fun times. Um, the only thing I had really learned from this institution was how to run an accelerator. So I started selling that as a service. I started my own company that, that does that. I've worked with large corporates like Boeing, Novo Nordisk, which is like the largest Danish pharmaceutical company, like the 10th largest in the world, um, BAE Systems, uh, AWS, and a bunch of other organizations like either training technical talent and running programs or work, working with startups and helping them work and sell into corporate. Um, and I hate corporates now. <laughs> now I'm joking. I th corporations are really interesting organizations. Universities are really interesting organizations. But there's a huge culture divide in how startups work and exist, as you're familiar, and how large organizations work and exist. And, and I think it's what I think of, I want to be doing moving forward is working more with founders. And so I'm, I'm pleased to say that I just uh, secured a new role with Bessemer Venture Partners, which is one of the oldest venture capital funds in the world. They're based in San Francisco. And last year, they raised $3 billion to invest in startups. So I'm really excited to start this new role. And if you are looking for capital or to talk more about that, I'm more than happy to like talk after. Um, just hit me up on LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, and we can chat more about what you're, what you're working on and how I can potentially help. Because... Um, this is why I wanted to stay involved in the community. And after you spent like four years building something, you want it to survive and thrive. And that's because you guys keep wanting to be parts of programs like this, which I think is really cool. I don't have any slides, um, but I've been working with founders for the last four or five years. So I'm happy to just kind of Q&A it. Uh, I know that the topic for today is working with your co-founder. How many of you like currently have like a co-founder or someone in like a senior role? So one, you guys, I'm assuming you're sitting next to each other and speaking the same language. That makes sense. Two. We are lone wolf over in the back. Cool. Um, interesting. So I think that my, the, the biggest wealth of my experience working with founders, there's like Accelerate Me has taught me so much about how difficult it is and amazing it can be. And then um, the other organization I worked with previously is called Entrepreneur First. Does anyone know Entrepreneur First? No worries. Basically, they, they work with uh, PhDs, very, very smart researchers, people who've been in, in like a corporate for a couple of years or an organization for a couple of years and really understand big problems, world changing problems. And what they do is they get a hundred of these people and they put them in a room together for three months and they just pay them a salary and they like work together on anything. I work with people who are using lasers in, in, on earth to charge lasers, uh, to charge satellites in space using lasers. People trying to grow skin people building um, some massive chatbots that like educate millions of people worldwide on how to be better with their finances um, and everything in between. And it's a really inter interesting place because it's at this really interesting intersection between like really young, smart people and just being like a, a human in the world with all of your own problems, but you're trying to build this really big business at the same time, like a massive business. Um, and from my time there, I think I picked up a couple of uh, like key, well, I don't know if they're lessons or just some key things that I've noticed in how people build businesses and how people work together and some key mantras around like what, whenever I work with a team, how I try and build like effective relationships. So something that EF does that I think is really integral is right at the beginning of the, the program, you are working with tons of people. And one of the first conversations that we're encouraging you to have is to be really open and honest about how you work and who you are. And sometimes you can like skip over that because you're just so excited about the idea that you don't even say stuff like, I love working in the mornings. I hate working in the evenings. I'm a vegetarian. I don't like this. I love that. I, um, my, my family is really important to me. I'm building a business because I want financial independence. I hate managers. I'm tired of corporate. I have this problem I really like and I want to spend loads of time on it. And so what happens is everyone gets really excited about the idea and you spend a couple of weeks or months or maybe longer working with each other and all of a sudden you realize that maybe you don't like each other very much or there's like a huge misalignment in what you're trying to build this business for. One really common one that was at EF, which was really interesting, was that the why. Why are you waking up in the morning to build this business, to bring it into the world? And if someone's there and they're like, I think this is my way of making millions and millions of pounds. And someone's there like, I really want to help my customers with the problem. That's a huge misalignment. And so if you don't have those conversations early, it's like it can work. But you need to have that conversation 
because you don't want to turn around like after four months, you've raised some capital, you have a team of like four or five engineers, and all of a sudden you're like, oh wait, <laughs> the person I'm supposed to spend the next seven years building this business with has a completely different aim from, from what I'm trying to do. That's really, really difficult to like to fix later on. And so um, we really, really worked on, or the, the team at EF really, really worked heavily on trying to build those those types of tools that could help people have those conversations in a way that didn't create judgment. Because one of the other things about being human is you don't want to feel judged, but you also want to be really honest with this person. And so if someone starts that conversation and says, I really want to help children learn English in another country, and it's, it's all about the infrastructure, and the other guy's like, fuck, I just, I just want a million dollars. <laughs> I just, I just really, I, I, I've never had a million dollars. My family never had a million dollars. I, I think that's my reason for build, building a really amazing company that's going to help loads of people is because it's going to be really well, wealthy. And then the other person's like, yeah, no, yeah, let, let's, let's help kids learn English in faraway countries. That's really great. That's, that's a great mission. But then you've lied and you've made a really, you built on a really rocky foundation. And so this is something I think that's really important. I'll stop talking soon and we'll, we'll just have a chat about what you guys are working on. But one of the other kind of really key things that we do is around like hard, hard feedback and having conversations. And it's really weird that you can go through high school and college and university and even into the workplace and no one ever teaches you really how to give feedback in a constructive way, how to be nice and kind and caring and honest um, in a way that helps build relationships in a really constructive way, right? If you're, if you're not being very nice, I hope you would want someone to explain that to you in a way that could exp like can, can help you improve, right? I don't think anyone is inherently not, not a nice person. I think we just, we're, we're products of our environment. We learn behaviors and traits, mostly from our parents, sometimes from society. And we're, we're taught interesting, like we're taught interesting mantras in the world when we're learning social skills about stuff like, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say it. Has, any, has anyone's parents ever said that to them? If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it. So in that moment of education as a child or as a young adult or a teenager, or even in the workplace, your, your brain, which is trying to compute a very simple function, which is don't say negative things. And so all of a sudden you've created this, this behavior in yourself where you can't criticize people that you, you care about and you want to help them improve because it comes across as you being mean or nasty or unkind. And I think that's such a weird part of social programming that's so detrimental. And some of the best founders I've ever worked with have been able to really like, look into that deeper and then build really effective relationships with their core team where they can be super critical in a kind way that creates great feedback loops and improves your relationships. And so in EF, one of the things that we, we kind of encourage is whether it's daily or hourly, or weekly, or monthly, like in some, some in some quite tight feedback loop, you have really open and honest conversations using a principle principle called radical candor. It was a book by an organizational psychologist that was um, uh, published probably about five or six years ago. It was quite a big thing in like startup -y world, like oh, we're all going to be radical. We're going to have radical candor, and radical candor leans into this idea of like that learning we have as a kid is very detrimental to like working effectively with a team especially in a startup where the idea is you're going to work closely together with a core team of people for like seven years. Like that's the average length of like the, the growth and journey of a startup that's on that kind of really high growth opportunity. Not every business is like that. Some are great and they, they last for three years and there's no reason they would close down except the founders lost interest or some last for 20 years and that's cool. Also something that is interesting to talk to your founder in the early days, like how, how, what's your time horizon on trying to build this business? Um, so once you've learned how to, uh, so in the principles of radical candor kind of fit into this quadrant of like being really kind and being very critical at the same time and, and explaining something. And the example that the author gives of like good radical candor is she was walking her dog, I think in Manhattan in New York, and she was walking her dog on the street and the, this dog wasn't very well trained and uh, it, she was holding it, but it had jumped almost into the street in front of a car and she had to like yank it back she got down on her knees and she was like really uh, quite stressed because this dog means a lot to her, of course, and it nearly got hit by a car. And a gentleman, complete stranger, comes up to her, like takes a knee next to her and the dog. I don't know if this story is even real, but it's a really passionate story about how to give good feedback. And he says, I can see that you care about this creature, this animal, so much, but if you don't teach it and train it, it's going to die and that's going to be really bad. And so he took a knee, looked right at the dog. And he said, sit, like in a very authoritative, strong voice. And the dog sat and she was like, whoa, you don't know my dog. I don't know you. And I've never been able to get my dog to do that. But by being stern and clear, not unkind, 
he had trained it to do something in, in one very specific moment that was really important to its survival. And the way I encourage founders and co-founders to talk to each other and work with each other is that you're doing it for the survival of the startup. You're not trying to be mean or unkind. You're trying to be clear with your feedback. And so it's so important. And so I've worked with teams that do feedback after, in the really early days, like after every big meeting. I think someone was talking about trying to get a pilot going or something. And if there's like two of you sitting on a, sort of sitting on a call with a client and you're trying to pilot a new technology or a new product and you have an amazing one hour meeting or you have a bad one hour meeting and you don't talk about anything at the end of it, you're like, oh, cool, cool, that's done. Like, what's the actions? Cool, actions, cool. You don't talk about, mm, I think when you brought this up, uh, I think we could have been a bit clearer about how we want to run this pilot. Or when we got into the pricing conversation, I think you're a little bit quiet and I think we need to show a more united front. Yes, you could be very upset by these comments if your co-founder said something like that to you. But if someone didn't, and you have another meeting, and another meeting, you're just going to keep failing, and the startup will die, and it will be because you didn't have good communication between the two of you, and you don't have hard conversations. And I've worked with founders who've literally had, like, every day, like, for two years, every day, they were at working day, they'll spend 10 minutes, just the co-founders, sitting and being honest about how their days went, and how, we, how they can constructively critique each other's behavior, how think meeting, big meetings went, how small meetings went, and those build, like, ridiculously healthy relationships. I imagine if you and your partner, boyfriend, girlfriend, whoever, were able to sit down every, minute, every day for 15 minutes and just have a really open conversation about how, not just like how my day went, but like, this thing annoyed me, this thing was really cool, I love you for this, I hate you for that, and like, I don't know if that would ever work, it would be an interesting social experiment, but I think it would be pretty interesting to, to better analyse and understand how we listen and take feedback on. The other side of radical candor is so much about you being able to leave your ego at the door. And that's really, really uncomfortable. Because we're, once again, we're like naturally built. We have built up these defenses as humans, as little kids that like mean things, helpful things, things that people want to change about you are, are flaws. And we don't like flaws. Flaws are bad. <clears throat> flaws are really good. And I think it's really, really, it's what makes us human and we can always improve. So it's really, really integral. Yeah. Any other interesting things? Yeah, I think the, the big fact that we would always say at EF is like the, uh, the, the average marriage in the US lasts, lasts shorter than the average companies and corporations. So the people that you're working with are more like closely found than your partners and you spend a lot of time with them. Um, and so I think it's super important to pick good people. And if you're on the journey to find someone, being really, really clear. And if you already have a founder, but you're looking for other people to join your team, like the relation, like the same way that a parent's relationship dictate how children form and develop and grow. Man, there's a lot more like child psychology than I was expecting for this talk. <laughs> this is what happens when you do slides. Um, but the same way like, your parents dictate how the culture of your house runs, or your parent, or whoever your guardians are, like, dictates the culture of how your house runs, it's the same with when you're building a team. And so if you have a poor foundation or a poor roof on this, on this like, house, then when you bring people in, they're going to be part of a culture that is dictated by two people who aren't getting along and aren't communicating well. And I don't know if, how much like, work experience you guys have had, but it's really horrible to work in a team where the management isn't enjoying themselves or having a good time or, or in an effective relationship with each other. And that definitely perpetuates into the, the lower layers of the organization. And I know that sounds really like, oh, Kieran, there's like two of us. Hopefully there'll be 10 of you one day. That means there are eight people here who aren't in this room right now, aren't thinking about how, that. And culture of co-founders is dictated 100% by every one person that gets it added, right? Right now, if you're a sole founder, then 100% of your company culture is you. You are your company culture. And there's two of you, it's 50-50. You had an engineer or, or a first business person or a marketing person, that's 33, 33, 33. And I think people really don't get that you dictate culture from day one. Like the things that you want to do, decide how new people will feel when they come into your organization. And, and those early, early people who join your mission are just as important as your co-founders, in my opinion, because they account for the same amount of output just divided. Yeah, I hope that was kind of, yes, Nico. Uh, I wanted to ask when starting, like early, early stage, when you're just starting to think of like joining a company, how do you really gauge commitment and that motivation they're going to have going forward? Because you said like, obviously companies last longer than marriage. Yeah. This is a person you're going to be in a working relationship for so long. What, what is like, Obviously, there's no perfect method, but what's the best way to kind of gauge that motivation and that drive? That's a, that's a really good question and probably like impossible to like tangibly or, or like organize. I think the way you have to look at it is like motivations can change, right? Like you can be sick or not really in it for a day. Like your motivation for the organization hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. So motivations can 100% grow. 
You can be the hundredth person in a team company, and like quote like your motivation is probably driven by equity and like options um, and salary, career growth. I think it's for you as the founder to inspire people. If you, like the the reason people would should will a hundred percent the reason that early people want to join teams and co-founders want to join other co-founders is because you have an ambitious vision that you want to bring into the world, and so your job is to sell this vision. And I would be very confused if you speak to early founders of any major company that's been successful in the last kind of decade, and they haven't said, I was just enamored, inspired, completely blown away by how impressive this founder was. She or he spoke to me and spoke about a world that they want to build that I want to be in. I want my kids to be in. I think that's so empowering and exciting. Because you can split the pie. You can give you can give an early employee fifty percent of the company, but fifty percent of nothing is nothing. So as long as you're building for this really ambitious thing, um, it's really that's what that's what it's about for me. How do you measure that? Like a default mechanism would always be hours thrown in for like for no zero or no or little remuneration, right? Like you, you don't just give shares away, you don't give equity away like day one. Oh, you want to come join my company? It's ten percent. If you are doing that, don't do that. Stop. Um, this is a really like. It's about building fundamental learnings w with with them and then like finding all of the ways that you can empower them along the way. So when I was running Accelerate Me, things that I would use to empower people were talking a lot about the people who had been in the, my shoes before. So like the person who ran Accelerate Me before me, he's now a product analyst at Hopin. And like ama amazing company doing amazing stuff. Like unfortunately, they've recently had like a huge layoff set, but like fundamentally amazing company doing amazing stuff. The person before that uh, is now like, it was like the first hire in one of the largest drone infrastructure companies in Europe. The person before that is now running her own startup and charity. The person before that w lived in San Francisco running Net, um, NatWest Ventures before. And so like I would find stories and journeys in, in the career because most people are in this organization for that career growth um, and find ways of empowering people about that. We had an office space. I could empower people with this. We had we put aside some like a little bit of money to do development programming across the thing. Like people learned huge amounts of skills here. And so you need to think about the little things that you can do with you and your co-founder as well that really empower each other to go further. Like if you get to say, we're going to sit in a room and we're going to work on a really hard problem for a year and it might go completely fail, fall flat on its face, but you're going to learn so many skills that you'll be one of the most employable people in your course. At the very least, that's an amazing opportunity to like for growth and students, recent alumni, you don't have a lot of, like there's a lower lower risk of failure as in like if the failure happens, you've still learned a huge amount and that's comp comparable. Right, if you need to feed your family, not so comparable, a bit trickier. But if you have no one else except you, it's, it's manageable. I don't think I've answered your question directly because I think it's always going to be tricky. And people can also bullshit you. Like, uh, like someone wants to be an early employee of something because it looks sexy and fun, but they don't have the commitment. Like you need to just catch onto that really quickly and then challenge them. But it's also your role to empower them too. Like you, it's not, you're not going to just find amazing people hanging from a tree who's like, oh, hey, I want to build your product. Oh, oh hey, I want to sell your product. Oh, hey, I want to brand your product. No, no, <laughs> that just doesn't happen. Otherwise, they would be founders because <laughs> they want to go build something, do something. So it's it's a, hundred, it's a lot more new than I think you, people realize. This is so much more management. It's it's really painful though, because like young founders, we just don't have a lot of management experience. So you're learning as you go. But like so many people have done it before you. There's no reason you can't do. Cool. Yes, Nico. So I imagine you've been in contact with a lot of founders and seen a lot of different like situations. So what are some of like the nightmare stories you've seen with co-founders? And like the key takeaways from that. Uh, nightmare, nightmare stories. Okay, no, not, no names, no organizations, no affiliation, right? Um, two founders working on this life science project and working together for like three or four months. And uh, one of them just calls me up out of like nowhere. And it's just like, he's threatening to take the IP and incorporate a new company. And, and like, they, like, I don't know what to do. I was like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> That's not a good call to have. <laughs> Ever. And so, um, that, if you look at the timeline of a point of like a failure, like the failure started a hell of a lot before that, right? That, that doesn't just happen. You just wake up in the morning and be like, right, I'm out. I've, I spent three months on this, but there's something cool here, but I hate you. So I'm going to incorporate another company and pull the IP over and it's like all going to work out like fine and dandy. Um, it's difficult when you've worked on something that's actually valuable. Like it's easy to, as I said, when you're a founder of zero, it's really easy to like break up because like no one's losing anything, no one's gaining anything. Some feelings might be hurt, egos might be hurt, but like it's okay at the end of the day. But when you have when you have something that's actually quite interesting and exciting and valuable, it's really it's really tricky. Um, 
the I, the takeaway from that story isn't to do with what happened next. It's it's identifying those points of failure way earlier. It's a dick move for for, any, for anyone to turn around and say, "I'm going to take all of this stuff that we've worked on and I'm going to make a new company." Some people are very driven by by the, by the th the idea of I want to build this, and anything less than that is like not what I'm here to do. And like once again, that comes back to early conversations and early honesty. It's something super unnatural. Um, I think. Uh, Another kind of another like more benign example. Will, I think all of my examples come back to just real bad miscommunication at the beginning of your journey about your values and what you're trying to what you're trying to achieve here. And those can change. Like, it's not like oh on day one I said this and so I, it can never change. Like it's, it's perfectly normal for for your lifestyle and what you're here to do and for your company to pivot and move and ebb and flow. And you as as founders then get to decide how you want to take it forward. But then be honest and, and update people and catch them up, right? Uh, paralleling it to a, like a conversation with your partner, you might get together and say, I don't want kids. And then in your 30s, you get broody and you're like, actually, I do really want kids. Like, that's not, there's nothing wrong with that. That's perfectly acceptable conversation to have in a, in a relationship. And so that's a perfectly acceptable conversation to have with your co-founder, not having kids, but like talk, <laughs> you're, think of it like that. There was a really cool slide from a, from a Y Combinator deck, which was like the, the big problem with co-founder relationships and the big problem with like romantic relationships have so many parallels, right? So like um, the biggest problems you'll have as like founders are around like uh, partners, money, um, kids. So your, your kid is your company. Your partners are your customers. Your your money is your investment, right? And so, like, if you have, if you're going to have a fight with your partner, it's it's almost mirrored one to one with the fight with your co-founder. And like, and treating it as such can be really helpful to like to deal with things. Has anyone ever had like a, an argument with their partner and they've just realised that they just wanted to have an argument? Like, there was nothing to fight about. It was just two people who are a bit stressed and were just looking for some reason to scream at each other. Okay. I think I have a healthy relationship, but I'm just going to take that as it happens. <laughs> If you ever get into that fight, just appreciate that someone wanted the fight to happen and it's happened and that's okay. And so like people are weird. Sometimes we do stuff like that. It makes no sense at all, but we're just, we're just humans wandering around, figuring out our own shit. And so, um, I look, I look at situations that, like that and I like, I completely understand that it, the level of communication I've just described and expected from you is like near impossible, but that's okay. Just appreciate that. If any, if at any point it's like got to that level of like I want to dissolve this company and take the IP somewhere else, like it's something fa fa faltered way earlier, and you need there's a there's a couple of really interesting like coaching podcasts from uh, like X. There's an, go, uh, I'll try and find it and send it to Oliver to distribute with you guys, but he was like an ex VC, um, and then he did a bunch of like coaching courses and like psychology courses, and now he now he's like a coaching um, couples therapist. Um, and it's really interesting to listen to his like his narrative and the way he analyzes the situation because you're spending so much time to eat with each other and we're just all a bit weird and there are things that change and grow and he mostly works with founders like after series A so these guys have like you've started in a room like this and now you have a team of like 50 people and you're like I don't know what I'm doing it's really scary we have so many people relying on us and then all of a sudden like you have the normal pressures of running a business like and then all of this extra stuff on top and you weren't prepared for that no one's prepared for that but you've learned and you figure it out and you speak to people who are more experienced and on that way you can maybe stumble into um a co-founders couples counseling or therapist and i think that's that's like a perfectly cool thing to do but i have I, I know of some really reputable vcs that expect this this is like if we invest in you you need to be spending an hour a month with this person or an hour every couple of weeks with this person who will help build better relationships the other thing about the whole co like why why people like co-founders is like it, it's really um grim but fundamentally like if if, if, if it's a sole founder a, an angel investor said this to me once if i invest in a sole founder and they get hit by a bus where's my investment <laughs> and i was like that's dark <laughs> but also makes perfect sense in a capitalist society we live in. So like the fundamental idea is bring, bringing people on board and, and being and like showing that you can sell your, your vision or the future to someone else who wants to do it with you. Like that's a really important part of the, that investment journey. So I've been blabbering on and there was no logical flow to any of the things I've just said, but hopefully it has been interesting. Uh, we have about kind of 10 more minutes or so. Um, does anyone have, yep, yeah, Nico, no, no. <laughs> Immediately. Do you think there's any situation where maybe it isn't right to have a co-founder? Mm. Um, I've, I've seen many like sole, and you would have known many companies where like it's a sole founder who takes it to the next level. They just get to a place very quickly where 
Example, you, if you have all of the basic skills, whether, if you're building a technology product and you have a tech background and you, can, and you can kind of sell it and you can kind of market it to a point where you can either make enough cash from cash flow that you can bring into team members or you can give equity to someone else and, and alternatively remunerate them. Yeah, fine. Be, like, be a sole founder. I, I have no issues with sole founders. I love sole founders. I think, I think it's really ambitious. It's just really hard. <laughs> And building a business already is really hard, and that's why. And it depends massively on your company. I would say, like, if you're a sole founder, make sure that you have all of the core competencies covered. And if not, learn them. Like, there's no reason people today can't learn, like, no coding, low coding skills. It's been going on for, like, five, six years really, really effectively. All the infrastructure's there. You can pick up cloud really quickly. Like, I used to work on an AWS program. It, it is, like, the, the, the building blocks are not super challenging. It really isn't rocket science. And then if you're not building a technical product, then you have even less of a barrier to entry to like tackle it. E-commerce, e um, Shopify is a perfect example of like the infrastructure that's out there to like take you to the next level. Um, and then there's like the more kind of figurative like stuff like, but you can, you can YouTube basic electronical stuff if you, electrics, uh, sorry, for any triple E people in the room. I don't think, I think you still need a degree to do advanced stuff, but like to just, to get a basic Arduino off the ground, it doesn't take a lot. Um, so I think you can definitely achieve it. Yeah. No, you, you said something about um, that that person that um, was like, oh, this guy is threatening to take the IP in the company. So what advice did you actually give that person? Yeah. So at the time, I was in a bit of a tricky place because I was working for an organization that had invested in the, I wasn't in the investment team. So it wasn't like bad, bad, but it was, I basically said, you need to have a conversation. Like they've already had investment in and you need to go talk to your investor. Like, this, it's going to be so much worse if you go to the investors when it's all like hit the fan <laughs> and now you're still in the conversational part of that experience right and something can still happen and I, I, I like I, I didn't uh, for me founders always come first like you can build a great company raise a lot of money and it can all go up in the air and then you can go build another amazing company like the founder hasn't gone and disappeared off the face of the earth like they're in a, they're a human they're a person I think it's so important for us never to forget that they're not a line on a spreadsheet um I think, but, but at the time, like the biggest, I think the biggest trigger had been, this was worth nothing and now someone's invested and now it's worth something. The IP is only worth something because someone arbitrarily said, we'll give you X many thousands of pounds for uh, X percent and all of a sudden it's valued, right? The coffee is only £2.30 because I'm willing to pay £2.30. The camera is only £1,000 because I'm willing to pay £1,000. And so like when IP, which is just this imaginary intellectual property of things in my brain, is worth absolute diddly until someone says, I'll pay you £100,000 for 10% or whatever it is. And so I think that was like a ma major driver for like the conflict, which was like, oh, it's all fine for me to be a bit upset with this relationship when it's worth nothing, but when it's worth something, now it's a perfectly adequate time to be upset with it. Um, the biggest thing I think was like the risk of that founder then making a rash decision in a moment of like fire and fury and anger. Like, how dare you? And this is why I say leave the ego at the door when you're having these conversations, because this is not personal. This is like, unfortunately, it's transactional to a business perspective, but it can be transformational too. Great co-founders can look, look so much more objectively at these conversations. But how do we, how do we all win in this amazing opportunity? I've heard of stories. I can't. I can't remember the exact like how it happens, but like sometimes co-founders leave and they take a wedge of equity because they're like, hey, like you wouldn't have got here without me. I'm just going to take five percent, and you can pay me out later. And then that five percent becomes worth a lot, and then they buy them out later. Sometimes it becomes worth nothing, and then everyone lost a little bit. Um, sometimes they will keep them on in an advisory role. You can put like kind of put them into like this advisory role and pay them in a, in, in a way where they just kind of reap a long term fee. You can license stuff depending if the technologist was building it or the business person was building it. There are loads of outcomes. There, there is an infinite amount of like fiscal outcomes, right? Because the pie is worth X and you can always take 1% or 2% or 5% or 8% or 10%. More often than not, when it gets to that place, though, similar, once again, to like a divorce hearing, is that people get childish. People want to like claw. They want their pound of flesh. They, 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 they're angry. And I think that's a really dangerous place to be negotiating from because you're not then looking for the best outcome. Of, of all of the modules I studied here, like that, those economics ones were really interesting. Um, where you have like a, a prisoner's dilemma between, between trying to make the best outcome and you have one, uh, you have two people in two separate rooms and like the police are interrogating, interrogating them are basically saying like, oh, this person's saying this and this person's saying that. And the moment you feel like someone's just, just like out to get you, you make a terrible decision and everyone loses. 
it's hard in the moment to ever think about basic economics when you're like upset and someone's threatening to take thousands of pounds of, or like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of pounds of IP away. But I think the most important thing I was working, I was trying to work with that founder on is like just calm them down to look at this objectively as a, as a what's the best outcome here. After that kind of interaction with your co-founder, it's hard to come back. That's the problem, right? How, how do you go back into the room after a spouse has cheated on you? How do you go back into the room after your co-founder has threatened to take away everything? That's why it's so bad when it gets to that level. It's really hard to pull, to pull back. God damn, maybe I should be like a relationship therapist. <laughs> Such a cool. Um, yeah. Have you ever seen a co-founder relationship where the equity wasn't like fair yeah. mathematically worked? like mathematically and then like objectively right so like best case scenario 50 50 it's really easy everyone's equally motivated it's all fun exciting i've seen founders who've split like five ways like 20 20 20 20 20 it's a bit rough for the founders who like some people are w were more integral in the early days but everyone showed up everyone's been there i don't think there is ever a way this is another tricky bit that instigates the arguments there's never a way to adequately similar to nico's argument um I could be in a room for an hour and you could be in a room for an hour and you could be at 90% efficiency and I could be at 40% efficiency. We were both in the room for an hour. Someone talked a bit more. The output's happened. Do I deserve 50% less than the person who gave 90? It's not how it works. And it never will be until we all get like neural links in our head that can actually measure optimal efficiency and we'll be like, oh, this is how we'll design equity on a, like an in real time model. Um, so I've met founders who have had drastic splits like 90-10. Uh, I've seen founders who have done like 99.1 for the early doors and then you unlock more equity later on. Um, does everyone, has everyone heard the term like a vesting cliff? A vesting, vesting cliff? Um, so basically a vesting cliff is when at, at the early doors, let's say there's two founders and both of you are like, this is a super exciting idea. We'd love to see where it goes. Um, but if we just have 50-50 now and then we break up, like what, what happens? Similar to the example I just gave. What happens with a vesting cliff is that you, you basically access your equity over a, p a period of time, traditionally four years. So let's say we, uh, we started a company together, me and you, we both own 50%, but at, in day one, day zero, no one actually owns any equity. In, on paper we do, but we don't actually have access to it. After one year, we both get 25% of our 50%. On the second year, it vests, and then after that, it usually vests like monthly. But your investor also wants to know that you're not just gonna walk away from this project. And so you don't like you can walk away from a project that's worth a lot of money, and if you have fifty percent on day one, you're like, okay, cool, I have a lot of money. But if you don't access any of it until a period of time has like has accrued, then it, it prevents that type of relationship falling apart. So this is a really traditional mechanism to to motivate and and make sure that founders are really dedicated throughout that whole experience. I try and encourage founders to to go for as as an equitable split in the early days as possible because. It leads, it's a very easy thing to lead to the fighting if you don't, because people will just be more and more demotivated. Uh, and I have friends who have, who have been kind of shafted by that before where they really don't feel like they've had the, the, the fair end of the stick and it's, it's festered inside them. It doesn't happen quickly overnight. It happens over a really long period of time. And it, fundamentally, it comes from a place of ego and lack of respect. They, they feel like they're not being respected. They feel like they're not, time's not being respected and it hurts. And it, over a long time, then it gets to them and then it explodes. Um, I've also seen founders who are like, I know I'm worth 10% of this business compared to the other person. The other person brings a network and money and capital and people and talent. Like if you're bringing so much to the table, yeah, sure. It makes perfect sense why it's not like a 50-50 split. I think there's only a like when I first had the conversation when I was running my e-commerce thing, it was like, we kicked the can down the road as long as possible. And, and because I kicked the can down the road, we were able to watch each other work for long enough to then make a good decision, which at the time, at the beginning, I was like, I think I'm bringing more to the table because I was young and, and had the ego and still do have the ego. Um, but after time working with them and watching them and seeing them come up with ideas and seeing them execute, I was just like, okay, I'm being an ass here. <laughs> like, I don't, of course we should split this. It should be, it should be fair. And that's going to bring a better relationship at the outcome in the end. Did you come across any 51-49% splits? Yeah. How they work well or how it causes problems? Yeah, I think it's often like the, f the, the first founder will, will pr push for that 51. And, um, and it works because the, the reason you would want to do that is just so that there's, a, there's an answer at the end. 
it's I've seen very good companies really struggle to make big strategic decisions because everyone has the same voting right. It's when when the, the top decision makers decide on the trajectory of the company. I've had I've like I have friends who work at startups and they're like the the CEO and the COO or the CEO and the CTO still butt heads and it's really damaging to the company because you imagine you have a hundred people and you need to make a really important decision but there's no one who has a quorum no one has enough to make to just to say we're going to do this and you get into this like plateau of indecisiveness um, where nothing gets moving. And you, you can like we can you can be generating revenue and doing okay, but like you could be doing so much better if you just picked something. Maybe option A is better than option B, but doing nothing is not better than either of them. <laughs> and so and and so you reach these stagnation points that are really really difficult to pu push past. And that comes from early infrastructure and early co-founder relationships. I think it's important, but you can have fifty fifty and and be the bigger person and and be the person who's comfortable to let go of the risk or take the risk. And say, we can be 50-50, but when we're having these big strategic decisions, are we comfortable with just saying, I'm going to take the lead? Yes or no? If no, how do we, come to, how do we, how do we break stalemates? Because in the early days, the whole thing, the, only re the reason you guys can win your markets and do better than your competitors is because you can move faster. And that slows people down massively. I think democracy is really, really important. I think it's really important for everyone's voice to be heard. But like taking quick decisions is like the biggest value proposition you have against anyone else doing what you're doing. Because you will probably win in the short term, at least, by just being a bit quicker. Just talking to one or two more customers, just talking to one or two more investors or partners or clients or pilots. That's the difference. Have you come across anyone who's maybe been, had a really small shareholder, like one or two percent, to be that sort of make weight, you know, in terms of decision making? I haven't looked too much into that type of like strategic piece. It would probably be like, a CEO and a CTO with like the equally splitting, and then maybe they have a, like an early employee who has some some weight. Um, it, it would be worrying to me if that was like the determinant factor. Like if you haven't had a, the honest conversation and it's come down to shareholdings to to like throw your weight around with that, I think maybe a bit tricky. Um, in the, in the early days, I don't think it's about shares to, des to decide, right? When, when you're Disney, of course, you need shareholder votes to make critical strategic decisions and, around organization, around hiring, around talent. Um, but in the early doors, it should just be more about, like, I respect your and I respect your opinion, but I think we need to move this way. Um, thank you for bringing your point. We, we, will, we, will, we will go forward with this idea and this st strategy or this approach. And until we change our mind or until new data comes in or until new evidence comes in that we've made a, a bad decision or we could be making a better decision, let's just move forward because forward is better than side to side. There's a saying that, that I, I got from EF, which is um, strong beliefs weakly held. I, I, it doesn't come from EF, it comes from another place. But the idea being great great founders are able to have real conviction about something but are also like very ready to change that could be difficult startups are difficult but if you if you kind of come in and you're like all, all over the place it that that side to side movement is really detrimental in the early days i've seen i think everyone's a little bit tired the room's a little bit hot um i think that's us for the session. Um, please hit me up on LinkedIn or Twitter if you want to catch up, have a chat. I love spending time with founders. Um, I'm sorry I didn't get to hear too much about what you guys are actually working on, um, but I'm going to have to run to get a train. Um, but yeah, I will be back up in Manchester for the Venture Further competition. So I would love to maybe catch up with some of you then. Has anyone applied? Cool. Cool, cool, cool.